So I am going to have to uh, apologize to start. Um, apologize to Katie Emerson. Where is she? She's here somewhere. She already, okay. <laughs> because I know that she loves figure skating. And I know I've spoken about this before, but I feel like any time that I can talk about judged, event in the, judged events in the Olympics, it's important to do so. Uh, I don't like judged events. I, I, and I, this isn't the same thing as me not liking watching it. I just don't, there's a certain part of it I don't like. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite things to watch in the Olympics is diving, and yet it's a judged event. One of my favorite things to watch in the Olympics is gymnastics, and it's a judged event. Figure skating is also an event in the Olympics. <laughs> and it's judged. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's incredibly impressive. Everything that, that these athletes can do, and I'm not saying they're not athletes, okay, but my issue with it is the judged part of it. It's, it's how, how pretty can you make it look which is, goes against the grain of what the Olympics is supposed to be about, in my opinion. Okay, I know I've spoken about that before. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot about that I don't understand. I'm sure there's a lot about these events that I don't understand. And like, there, there are things that you can objectively see um, that, that if you know the events well enough that you'll be able to tell. But even at its best, I feel like there's still the possibility of personal bias. You know, it's, it's just too easy to, to give someone just a little mark off because you don't like that country or you're, you're cheering for somebody else. I, I just think it's there. Even in my favorite sports, okay, basketball, baseball, football, we see a little bit of, a little of this. You know, was, was, that, was that a travel? Did he get his hand under the ball? Was that, you know, was that actually a catch? Was, it, was, that, was that really a, a strike? Um, we, we have instant replay and video review and they still get it wrong. They, they still, sometimes these calls still go against my team. <laughs> I think the issue is that human judgment is inherently flawed because humans aren't perfect. And, and until we get to the point where you can like get some kind of artificial intelligence to be able to tell exactly, you know, what the right answer is, I, I don't see that ever coming. Um, it, it's just going to be flawed. And this, this happens in our lives as well. You know, any time that you have to make a judgment call on something, there's a chance that you're wrong. You're not always wrong. In fact, I would say most of the time you might even be right. Um, but even if you're mostly right, you're still the possibility of being slightly wrong. And so I think that, don't get me wrong, I, I, I still think we're called to judge things. I, I, I don't think we're supposed to be judgmental, but I think we're supposed to know the difference between right or wrong. I think we're supposed to be able to say what is right or wrong based on God's word. Um, we're supposed to be loving in all things, no matter how we do that. But when you and I judge, we do it imperfectly. When God judges, he does it perfectly. He does it as punishment, and he does it as protection. And a lot of times we just look at the, the judgment as saying, okay, well, that's just all about the punishment. But today we're going to learn that as much as it's about punishment, I, in fact, I would say it is more about protection. We are partway through a series called Among Wolves. We're looking at the book of Second Peter. And this is a letter that Peter wrote to the church, uh, not a specific church, but like to the church in general. He knew that he was, his, his days on earth were coming to an end. Somehow God informed him that, you know, he was going to be, uh, be leaving soon. And he wanted to pass his wisdom on to, to the church. He wanted everyone to know, this is what, this is what I learned from Jesus. And, and even more than that, he wanted to warn them warn them about the wolves in sheep's clothing that was trying, they were trying to lead the church astray. And so we're going to talk about those wolves today. Starting in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. He says, There were also false prophets in Israel. So uh, remember, when, when Peter wrote it, he didn't separate it into chapters and verses. He just sort of wrote a letter. And then later on, we went through to help us memorize things and to understand where to find things we put in the chapters and the verses. So Peter finished the last chapter by talking about prophets and, and saying, you know, the things that I saw happen on earth, that when I saw Jesus transfigured, transformed, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the video from last week. But when I saw that happen, it confirmed for me all the writings that, that the prophets wrote about Jesus. All these, these prophecies that came true in Jesus, I saw it happen. But then he starts this part and he says, but as many true prophets as there were. 
there were also false prophets in Israel. You know, wolves in sheep's clothing, just as there are false teachers among you. And so Peter is, is laying it out right now. He's saying, you know, there's a lot of good stuff in the church, and there's some things that we know we can put our, plant our flag in, the fact that Jesus is Lord, but I've got to warn you, I've seen false teachers in the church. This is what Peter's telling them. And the scary thing is, he says, they will cleverly, cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. So, in a lot of ways, it would be easy if the, if the false teachers were obvious. You know, if the false teacher was totally obvious, no one would follow them, but they're clever, and they're usually well-spoken, often handsome, you know, they're just, they, they come forward, and it, something about them makes you want to follow them. And it's part, of the, part of it is their clever arguments. But Peter wants to make absolutely sure we understand they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Now, I don't know if he's saying um, that, that God's going to take them out, you know, basically, you know, like, supernatural assassin. You're, you're leading my church wrong, you're going to die. Or if he's just sort of saying that when the end comes, they will suddenly dis- discover how wrong they are and that they'll be destroyed. Now, even that, they, they know they're wrong. They know they're wrong. I don't think this is, a, I don't think Peter's talking about people who are confused. He, in, at least in this chapter, he's talking about people who know the truth but have decided to abandon the truth in order to further their own lives. Instead of being about God's kingdom, they're about their own kingdom. And he says, Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. Because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. And so sadly, I've got a number of pastors, former pastors, some still pastors today, uh, all of whom have been implicated in scandals. Some uh, shameful immorality. I mean, it's all immoral, but you know, what he's talking about here with the word shameful immorality is more of a sexual nature. And some of these guys up here, and honestly, I could have filled the screen with pictures this small. I mean, there are so many horrible stories in the church of people who have led others astray. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. Now, remember, in, in the early church, they never really referred to themselves as Christians. They, they, they were referred to as followers of the way, most often. And so Peter here is talking about the way of truth, and he's saying, you know, our faith is being slandered because of the false teachers. Now, how many people, when you say you're a Christian, are a little hesitant to do so because you know that the person you're talking to knows some of these stories. And if not these stories, they know other stories. You know, they they know about child molestation in the church. They know about uh, adultery in the church. They know about people who have been stealing money. They know about, not even stealing, but, you know, just being, sometimes asking for money and, and trying to lead people astray that way and people, you know, sheep will give them the money. And so you've got these, some guys, you know, flying jets, living in mansions and saying, this is the way to God. And I don't know about you, but I think it gives a black eye to the faith. Peter says, the way of the truth will be slandered. And then he goes on, he says, for God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell, in gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. So he just said, you know, God condemned them long ago. Their destruction will not be delayed. Understand, God is still in control. And so even though there are false teachers in the church, even though there are wolves among the sheep, God's in, God's in control. God's in charge. He may, you know, he may allow some things to happen, but he's not, he's not powerless about it. And judgment will come. And to, to prove that, Peter says, you know, even the angels who sinned. And, and there's a lot of different theories on what this is talking about, and, and, and we're not going to go into it right now, but, you know, simply to say there were some angels who fell away from God, who, who for whatever reason decided they did not want to follow God anymore. And so God threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness, which was interesting to me, because last, uh, a couple weeks ago, we finished the book of Ephesians. And what did we talk about? 
We talked about angels and demons, right? We, we talked about wearing the spiritual armor of God to protect us against demonic attack and de- demonic presence. And, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. If, if these angels are in gloomy pits of darkness and being held until the day of judgment, who's attacking us? And so I was, you know, reading some commentaries about this, and, and what, what's, I, what seems going on is that there are some angels who, when they cross the line, God said, okay, you're in prison, and you don't get out until the day of judgment. And for whatever reason, other angels are still free to attack us. Uh, and you might ask the question, well, why? Why is that being allowed? And that, that's a question for God. I can't answer that. You'll, you'll have to ask God when, he gets to he- when you get to heaven. All that to say, God is going to judge people who, who, are, who are leading people astray. You know, he, he didn't spare the angels. He's not going to spare these false teachers. So this, this is kind of twofold. Hey, don't follow the false teachers because they're, they're destined for destruction. Second thing is don't become a false teacher because if you do, you're destined for destruction. And then uh, Peter goes on. So that's, the, that's sort of the first example. He's, he's sort of laying out his case here. This, this, is, this is how I know these people are going to be destroyed. God did not spare the angels, and God did not spare the, spare the ancient world, except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. So again, if you know your Bible history, if, if you grew up in, in the church, you certainly knew about this story from Sunday school. And we usually don't see this picture, right? We usually see a, a boat full of animals, often with two male lions. I don't get that, but, you know, it's just, it's all sunshine and like, hey, this is sort of what happened after the fact. We forget, or at least we don't focus on it because it becomes a kid's story. We forget about the, the fingernails scratching on the hull of the ark saying, let me in. And God judging those people and saying, no, it's, you had your chance, and now you're being judged. He goes on, he goes, Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. And so, again, we're, we're seeing, you know, di- God didn't save the angels that, were, that went wrong. He threw them in prison. He judged them. God didn't spare the ancient world that was so full of sin that God said, you know, I need to start over with just Noah and his family. God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, he sent fire, uh, fire and brimstone down on them. He basically nuked the entire city, cities of, fire, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. All this is Peter's way of saying, you know, if you are a false teacher, this is what's coming for you. If you follow a false teacher, this is what's coming for you. There's a flip side to all of these, right? Uh, Noah, God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, uh, sorry, um, yeah, sorry, Sodom and Gomorrah, God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. Sometimes I wonder, you know, why was Lot still there? If the city was so evil, so awful, why was Lot still there? And, you know, I sort of started to wonder, was Lot sort of falling into that? Maybe, maybe he was being uh, drawn that way. But here, Peter makes it pretty clear. No, he was, he was tormented by the wickedness he saw. Like, like, Lot was still a righteous person. And so you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. And so we see that the, the two sides of the same coin. You know, the angels are put in prison. Why? To protect humanity of being attacked by the angels. Uh, not all the angels, just, you know, the, the ones who fell away. Noah and his family are protected from the evil of the world. Lot is protected from the, the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. As God brings punishment, he also brings protection for those who follow him. So last week we talked about the skeptical doggo. You know, these are people who, who are really, I'm not sure wolf is the appropriate term. Okay. Uh, they are, um, they were people who were like, just not sure. You know, they really ask questions and maybe ask too many questions. They're really, you know, like, it's one thing to not be sure, but Sometimes you might push it a bit too far, and that's, that's kind of who Peter was talking to last week. 
They, they might try to draw people away because they're not sure, and so they're the skeptical ones. Today we're talking about the dirty dogs. All right, these are the wolves. And when I say dirty dog, you might be thinking like the dog that rolled in the mud. This is more probably like rabid dogs. Okay, they're, they're, they're dirty and they're dangerous. These are the ones Peter's, are ta- Peter's talking about today. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. Uh, the, I, I put up here rotting fruit because that's kind of the word that, that Peter's using here. When he says like twisted, it's, 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 it's rotting. It's just malignant. That's the kind of sexual desire they have. Now I know people think that maybe I, certainly other pastors, definitely the church spends too much time talking about sexual immorality. It's like that's like our favorite hobby horse, especially in certain ways. You know, uh, if, if, if you go to a church, you think, well, they, they love talking about homosexuality. They love talking about transgender. Um, personally, I don't. But it does come, on, come up often in God's word. And the other thing I would say to that is, why is there a war going on in Ukraine right now? Why are, why are the Ukrainians fighting? Because they're under attack, right? Why are they fighting in Ukraine? Because that's where the attack is coming from. And so why, are we, why do we spend so much time talking about sexual immorality? Because that's where the attack is coming from. You know, God's word is, it's there. It doesn't change. Our society is the thing that is changing. And the devil is trying to uh, transform people's minds around the ethic of sexuality. And so I don't, I don't love talking about same-sex marriage. I don't love talking about transgender. I don't love talking about any of this stuff. You know, I, I would much rather talk about the positive aspects of sex. By the way, did you know that married people have more and more satisfying sex than anybody else? That's God's biblical sexual ethic. And our culture is under attack by the devil trying to lead us astray to say, no, no, you've got to do this other stuff. You know, you don't follow those rules. Guess what? The rules are there as, as guidelines to help keep us safe and, and, and let us do the things that God wants us to do. Think about the Garden of Eden. Think about the Garden of Eden. What, what were the rules? There was one rule, right? You may eat of any tree in the garden except this one. And what do we people do? We focus on the one thing we're not allowed to do instead of all the good things that we are allowed to do. So when it comes to, to God's sexual ethic, you, people might say, oh, look at all the things you're not allowed to do. God gives us guard rule, guardrails and says, you're allowed to do all the good stuff in there. The other stuff is going to hurt you because it is malignant. It is like, it's like rabies. And God is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. Uh, and I think this is, this is largely talking about the, the authority of God. You know, God can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do my own thing. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels, who are far greater in power and strength, do not dare to bring... Uh, from the Lord, a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. Uh, The the thing I think is important to focus on here is that that God is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. Peter's talking about the wolves in the church. He's talking about the leaders that are trying to lead people astray. And there are certain kinds that are like rabid dogs. And it's largely around this area of sexuality and authority. But also like also greed. We'll come to that in a moment. It says, these false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they will be destroyed. So again, Peter is, is, is just giving it to us straight. There are dangerous people in the church, dangerous teachers in the church. And it's not enough for us to just say, well, yeah, you know, they have their opinion, we have ours. It is danger. It leads to destruction. And so certainly I as a pastor, you as brothers and sisters in Christ, I think it is our responsibility. In fact, I would say I know it is our responsibility to protect those who are under attack from others. So if you know somebody who is following a false teacher, we need to come alongside them and and teach them this is the right way to go. 
don't start following after, it's not a difference of opinion, it is dangerous, it is malignant, it's like following a rabid dog. Their destruction is the reward for the harm that they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. Among you. All right? Peter's not talking about people outside the church. He's talking about people who are inside the church. Now, I would not say they're Christians. I would say they're people who learned about Christ. They probably, uh, maybe they grew up in the church. They, They know all the Sunday school answers but they've abandoned God's way. And they've, they've decided to follow their own way, to bring their own kingdom to, to, to the forefront. But they are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They might be at a potluck table with you, right? but they are dangerous. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin, and they are well-trained in greed. They live under God's curse. And then he gives us another example from the Old Testament. I feel like Peter, when he was writing this, was probably reading some Old Testament scripture. It says, They have wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. Okay, if you don't know Bible history, that sounds really weird. Uh, if you do know your Bible, Bible history, that might still sound weird. It's a story from the Old Testament. A story from the, you know, the Israelites were under attack from a, a different group of people. These people hired a, a prophet to try to condemn them, to basically bring curses down on Israel. Uh, end of the story is that he ended up you know, bringing blessings on Israel because God intervened. All that to say that he was somebody who was willing to take money to do what was wrong. And what do we, what do we see about these false prophets? All right? They're in it for what they can get for themselves. A lot of them are in it for the, you know, because they want to take advantage of people sexually. A lot of them are in it because they want to take advantage of people uh, and, and their money. Some are in it for both, let's be honest. But they're like Balaam, you know, earning money to do the wrong thing. Peter gets harsh here. He says, These people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. Now, I said earlier, we need to be loving in all things, and uh, I, I think this is getting close to the line. I mean, he is really, really harsh what he has to say, which tells us how dangerous these people really are. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting, with an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who barely escape from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. So a couple things here. Um, you know, as you read this, you might think, so is he talking about people who are losing their salvation? Uh, if you start talking about, you know, can you lose your salvation, you start having conversations about Calvinism and Arminianism, um, and if those names, words don't mean anything to you, I, I think that's fine. Honestly, I do not enjoy having those conversations. I'm not, I'm not someone who's, you know, I'm a five-point Calvinist or I'm a five-point Arminianist. I think these are, these are things that people have come up with to try to understand something that is that largely un- ununderstandable and left to God. So if you, are a, if you are a Calvinist, you'll read this passage and you'll say, uh, these are people who were not fully Christian. You know, they, they may have come through the door of the church. Maybe they even grew up in the church, but they never made a full commitment to follow Jesus. And now they're being led astray and back into a sinful lifestyle. If you're an Arminianist, you'll say, well, these are people who lost their faith. All right? To me, it's semantics. It doesn't really matter. It's up to God to know who is actually saved and who is not. All that to say that there are people who are being lured away by these, these wolves. And that's Peter's main point here. He doesn't want to get us... I don't, I don't think he meant to get into a, a theological argument about can you lose your salvation. He's saying, stay away from the wolves. They're dangerous. And this is so big. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves to sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. And so these these people who are maybe saying, hey, I want you to be free. I want you to be able to do whatever you want. Hey, if you want to, you know, go out and and have an affair, go have an affair. You're free to do so. But they don't understand that they're actually slaves to sin. How did Peter start this letter? I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. He knew that you're a slave to somebody. You're either a slave to Jesus or you're a slave to sin. And which would you rather be a slave to? 
personally, I'd rather be a slave to, to God, a God who loves me, than to something that's going to control me and, and kill me. He goes on, he says, when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. This is kind of like, uh, when I think about this, it's like an inoculation. You know, you get just a little bit of the thing and it keeps you from getting the, the main thing, as far as I understand science, which is not at all, right? But now do that with Christianity. You know, you, you, you come to church, you get just enough of it to say, okay, I, I kind of understand it. You maybe think you're saved, but you don't get the whole thing. And you're worse off than you were before if you get dragged back into the world. Because maybe you think, you know what? A, I'm not going to follow those leaders because all they want is my money and they want to take advantage of people sexually. Or you just think, hey, I'm already Christian and I've been taught everything I need to know because you were, because you were taught by wolves. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command and they were given, that they were given to live a holy life. You know, it's, it's better if you never step foot in a church than to go through that process that I just talked about. Because when you do come in, then you can hear the truth for the first time and hopefully uh, the Holy Spirit will capture your heart. Peter talks about these people. He says, they, they prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to a vomit. And another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. And that's pretty disgusting, especially the vomit part. I don't know why dogs do that. I don't know why people do that. I don't know why people are going to return to their sin. I don't know why I sometimes do that myself. But when God washes you clean, you don't want to go back and get muddy. You don't want to get dirty. So all that to say, watch out for false teachers. All right? Understand that there are still false teachers in the world. Uh, you might think I'm one. What do you do? You be like the Berans. In the book of Acts, we learn about these people. The people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. They listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. I promise you, I only want to teach you the truth. I know I'm fallible. I might make a mistake. And so if you know God's word well enough, you'll be able to tell if I make a mistake. You'll be able to come alongside me and help correct me. But if you hear from somebody else who is out to get you, one of these wolves in sheep's clothing, someone who is, who is eager to try to take your money or take advantage of you another way, if you know God's word, then you will, it will just stand out to you and say, that's counterfeit. That does not belong. So be like a brand. Compare what you are hearing to what God has taught you in the Bible. Even when I say it, okay? I'm, I'm, as your pastor, I'm telling you this. Make sure you know God's word. That's the reason Paul, uh, sorry, that's the reason Peter wrote this letter. He knew he wasn't going to be around forever. He said, I want people to know what God taught so they wouldn't be led astray. Second thing is trust that God will judge. And this is, this is bad news for false teachers, but it's good news for everybody else. So, you know, just like Noah, it was good news as much as it was probably horrible for him. And I think he probably had some PTSD from it. But it was good news that he was rescued as God punished the rest of the world. Knowing that you are a slave to Christ sets you free. That's the protection that God gives you. We know that we have a good and perfect judge seated on the throne of, in heaven. I mean, we, we know that. We know that God is good and we know that God is a judge. And we put our trust in him to punish those who are wrong and to protect his children. That's really what this is all about. Our job is to know his word so well that we can recognize when teaching is false. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come up and lead us. So you know when you're reading a book and you think you're done, and then you see the words epilogue? <laughs> uh, I just want to bring a little clarity to uh, something I was talking about. The Lord is our shepherd, and he's given us a path to walk on. And occasionally, we as sheep will follow off that path. We'll do our own thing. Uh, we'll, we'll go astray. And... I want to make sure I, I, I communicate here that if you step off the path, it doesn't automatically make you a wolf. You know, if you are struggling in, in an area, um, I don't want you to feel like, well, I guess I'm destined for, you know, the gloomy pit of hell like those angels. No, there, there is hope and there is freedom in Jesus. The, the Holy Spirit is the one that brings us, I mean, he, with, with his rod and his staff, he comforts us and he brings us back to where we need to be. The, the, the guardrails are there for our protection. When we step outside of them, um, we're going we're, we're gonna to suffer for it, but 
our loving Heavenly Father brings us back in. I'm, I'm talking about people, um, and it may have been unfair of me to have that picture of all those pastors up there. I mean, I, I wasn't intentionally saying that they are all wolves. You know, some of those are, are Christians who, uh, who've, who've fallen away. I, my, my point with that is that it brings bad name, a bad name to uh, the church. When, when you step outside the path, our Heavenly Father, loving Father, brings you back in to give you hope and freedom. And, and I want to make sure I understand that. You know, I'm, I'm, when I talk about wolves, I'm talking about those who are outside of, of the, the path, those who are intentionally trying to draw others away, uh, not necessarily those who just struggle from time to time. So um, I want us to be wise. The main point of this message is to, to understand we need God's word. We need to know what he teaches us. We need to understand it so that we can recognize the truth when, when we hear it and recognize lies when we hear them as well. Um, but I also want us to be hopeful. Hopeful to, to know that there is forgiveness. And, uh, and if that is something that you need to talk more about, please come talk to me after the service. Love to. Now I'll give it over to the worship team.